Hello, and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be discussing this awesome book which I recently read, Dr. Moocher's Marvels by Kristen O'Keefe, after which I'm really happy I saw it on a special display in the library because I really, really love, you know, like medical curiosities and science and medical history and stuff. And the Moocher Museum in um, Philadelphia is on my bucket list of museums in the world to travel to because it's just, you know, right up my macabre alley. And as you can see, I'm getting into spooky season early with some spider earrings hooked under my um, stretched ears. And so anyway, let's just um, read the synopsis. In Dr. Moocher's Marvels, Kristen O'Keefe Aptovich chronicles the remarkable life of Dr. Thomas Dent Moocher, 1811 through 59, a dazzling young American surgeon who was so flamboyant and audacious that he wore colorful silk suits to perform surgery, embellished his last name with an umlaut, and was described as the P.T. Barnum of the surgery room. Rising to the challenges of operating on the severely deformed while they remained awake, as was the standard practice, and when others viewed them only as monsters, Mutu was a revolutionary figure whose compassion-based philosophies and innovative surgical ideas and breakthroughs clashed with the constraints of the era. The vast collection of medical oddities he amassed to serve as teaching tools for his enormously popular lectures as a professor of medicine would later become the foundation for one of the most infamous museums in the world, Philadelphia's Mutu Museum. In Mutu's childhood as an orphan in the antebellum South, and his years spent studying radically avant-garde plastic surgery in Paris, his struggle to establish himself in the medical mecca of Philadelphia, and the tumultuous rivalries among his fellow doctors, many of whom publicly mocked Mutu's philosophies and procedures, Dr. Mutu's marvels delves deep into the life and career of a man who was truly ahead of his time. Through Mutu's humanist eyes, we are given a front row seat to the evolution of American medicine, bleedings and leechings and surgeries performed on fully conscious patients, the standardization of medical schools in the institution of pre- and post-operative care, the discovery of anesthesia in the medical community's frustrating resistance to the anti-sepsis practices of washing hands and sterilizing tools, the unimaginable medical cases resulting from the rise of industrialism, the har harrowing challenges women's, women face, both as largely mistreated and misunderstood patients, and as aspiring doctors striving to be seen as equals, all of it set against the calamitous backdrop of a country marching towards the Civil War. Based on more than 15 years of research, including full access to the extensive archives of the Mutcher Museum, Dr. Mutcher's Marvels is suffused with fascinating period detail, compelling narrative, and memorable characters, Illustrated with more than 70 startling images, this is the never-before-told true story of a dramatic turning point in American medicine through the journey and influence of one extraordinary man. And the author is a woman after my own heart. When I saw her picture, if you can see, she's like posing with a skull. That's also something on my bucket list. I would love to have, you know, like a skull for display purposes, not necessarily a human skull, but, you know, like a good enough replica. I just absolutely love the macabre and medical curiosities and stuff like that. And I picked out a few things to read, a little bit excerpts along with the notes which I took. And so many of the chapters begins with an excerpt from Mutter's own textbook, like you know, the physician or the medical man should be this, and like going into detail about these like wonderful qualities that any doctor should possess and why obviously given the era he would use like a generic he because like unfortunately women weren't admitted into medical school schools until like, you know, much later, but Philadelphia did eventually have like a revolutionary medical school just for women and many women who wanted to be doctors went there from around the world. And so anyway, this is one of the first things. The medical man must obtain a thorough medical education, which wasn't always, you know, the case back in his era, unfortunately. To secure true eminence, not popularity, not notoriety, not the distinction that friendly or family, influence or wealth may for a time confer, the medical man must, as the first and most important requisite, obtain a thorough medical education. But I would caution you against attempting eminence in any other department of science. One science only will one genius fit. So vast is art, so narrow human wit. And he was a really interesting guy. It wasn't just like, you know, boring stuff he's writing. He's, you know, trying to do personally connect with student and like infusing a little bit of poetry with him as well. And here is another one. The physician should have a reverence for his art. You know, you should really go into medicine for the right reason, not because you're like, trying to get power and glory and money or all that stuff. In every village in our land, the parson, the lawyer, and the doctor are the great men of the place, and none stands higher than the doctor, whose friendship is more highly prized, whose name is so often coupled with expressions of gratitude and love and confidence, whose visit is more anxiously expected or more warmly received, 
whose cheerful smiles and kindly expressions so readily banish gloom and sorrow, whose hand is so eagerly grasped by the devoted wife when she thanks him for the care with which he has watched over her husband, herself, or her children, and to whose ear is the tale of private griefs, hidden sorrows, blighted hopes, and dreadful anticipations of the future so readily poured forth. Be ye sure, gentlemen, that such a position is an object worthy of the utmost desire and is a reward more precious than rubies for the fatigue, anxieties, and sorrows with which the pursuit of his calling is almost necessarily attended. And the book goes into detail not just about um, Mutter and his own life in the medical school, but like, you know, Philadelphia of the era. It was like really, really horrific. The population just, you know, it exploded in the early years of American independence and many of the people living there were immigrants and they were also you know, like poor and working class so they were like a lot of child labor and working at these factories was absolutely you know horrific condition and women making matches in the old days they would be like exposed to the phosphorus and they would start like, poisoning themselves like eating through their skin and their jaw would be visible and they would you know, get brain damage eventually an organ failure just like absolutely horrible things and obviously crushing injuries from like, like equipment falling on you in many factories and just like horrible horrible things many people today like they just don't understand how difficult life was in the past and they, I really wish you know people would like learn more about history and like be you know, grateful for the life we've been given in the 21st century we don't have to worry about like child labor or, you know, like dying on the workforce just like little things like that and so anyway um Dr. Mutter was born in Richmond Virginia on the 9th of March 1811 his Parents were married. Well, his mother, at least, was married when she was um, 15 years old. His father was 10 years older, which was like, extremely like unusual in that era. Despite how many people, a, a historical. I mean, I realize many people like genuinely believe that, but it's just you know like a false urban legend. Like most couples historically were about like you know one to six years apart, and like women were not generally you know, marrying at all of 15 years old. But anyway, they did have like a happy marriage despite the huge age gap and like the mother marrying when she was like so so. Young and they had two two children. I'm um, um, Thomas, and after him there was a little brother, James. But unfortunately, um, little James died um 13 days after his first birthday in 18 18 14, and that was like a he just barely beat a harrowing statistic in that era. Like one out of five children died died within like their first year of life, and that's another urban legend also, in which many people misunderstand. Like the reason why historical like life expectancy it, it skewed so low. It wasn't because like the average person like dropped dead at all of 35 it was because like so many children they it was like high high like huge infant more mor morality mortality i'm sorry and like obviously like women dying in childbirth too obviously like skewed it much much lower but if you did like you know live past like childhood and if you were a woman who did not die in childbirth like you had a pretty good chance as much as anyone in any era of living to 70 or 80 but unfortunately like the people in his family they just like didn't beat that statistic they had like you know very shortened lifespans and in that autumn of eighteen fourteen after the family tragedy of losing um little Jimmy, his mother Lucinda died at only twenty two years old. She had been had reclining declining health for a while and obviously this um devastated his father John and his health was also deteriorating. He was also having like bad luck in business and like money problems. He had to like sell like all of his furniture at one point. And so in eighteen eighteen he went to Europe hoping to recover his health because you know, like in the the, the medical wisdom of the era, like if you were in the north, oh, the north the U.S., oh, you go to the south because they have such a nice climate and hot springs and stuff. But if you're already in the south, like where do you go? You go to Europe to like try to recover your health and stuff. And when he was like four months after the tour began, he was hiking through the Alps. He unfortunately passed away and because, you know, obviously the early 19th century news took a long time to travel. And so they didn't like find out about this for months afterward. And um, Thomas was living with his grandmother. Francis at the time and she also was in declining health which you know like this poor like family and this boy just couldn't catch a break and uh, the treatments that his grandmother was getting like from some being bled or giving stuff to the like vomit or have diarrhea or just like you know cupping stuff I don't know the correct term like you would like put like hot rocks or cups on people to so-called like draw toxins which is surprisingly popular with the pseudo scientific crowd now but obviously that was like total woo and crack quackery and it was like making her even sicker than the like pre-existing medical conditions and so she died soon too and by the time he was seven years old Thomas was like a, a complete orphan but a distant cousin by mother by marriage on his mother's side Robert Wormley Carter stepped in to you know like become his guardian he was raised on a vast estate with like you know lots of 
slaves and like just like huge like land and, and the mansion was even expanded within his, his own lifetime so it became even larger and grander and like he was used to being you know spoiled by his father and like his guardian Robert he was like okay I'm not going to spoil you to that extent but I'm not going to like treat you horribly like someone in the Dickens novel or something like that although he was you know kind of like off put even as a at a young age Thomas absolutely loved his you know flamboyant bright loud colorful clothes and like you know the suits and the expensive shoes and stuff so it was kind of like scandals like dude what are you doing you're spending all my money when you're away at boarding school on these suits this has to stop soon but he was given a, a fine education nonetheless first at home with tutors and then he was sent away to a good boarding school and then he started attending Yale and then in that era like many people might not realize this the average age for, for starting university or college was 14 years old because education was structured a lot differently they didn't really have the concept of high school until like much much later into the late 19th century even into the earlier 20th century many places still didn't have a high school so that's why like people general and when I say people I mean like almost all men given like the constraints of the era they didn't they started college like so so young they weren't all like you know prodigies it's just you know they were learning much differently than they would in the modern era and so anyway he wasn't you know happy at Yale and his health was also suffering and so he decided to like go back to Virginia and this proved to be like a wonderful thing for him so he began studying under some doctors and attended um, Hampton Sydney College in Virginia which is like basically one of the oldest schools in the U.S. and it was actually formed like you know before like America gained independence and it's like just a venerable venerable medical school and he um, continued his education at the University of Pennsylvania and he absolutely loved you know being a doctor this was just a career that absolutely spoke to him and surgery in particular was happy for him because like you have to like earn your keep and like become a surgeon instead of just like oh I have family money and connections and that's how I'm going to become a doctor that way and so in that era you know lots of med- medical people like doctors and such they would go to Paris to continue their education or just learn new surgical techniques because this was still when like France had like a really high and mighty reputation you know, like people would like go from all over to study art and medicine and stuff and they would come back all refreshed with these wonderful ideas and he was like really happy about the chance to go to Paris himself in um 18 18- 31 but because you know he wasn't you know mr. Moneybags he didn't have any class privilege oh I can just like drop a bunch of money so I can like take steamship oh, no, they didn't even have steamships then just like a ship like back and cross like going to Europe constantly like like it's nothing he actually had to you know sail on a naval ship as a surgeon's mate and then the competition was that, for that was fierce but he did you know eventually convince somebody to let him go on and the good thing about that obviously it's like kind of like being sort of almost like a steerage passenger but it was just like a good way to travel for free but you know obviously it wasn't as nice as like having a whole like stateroom if you're like you know a first class millionaire but once he was in Paris he absolutely loved the experience like interacting with all these like exciting new doctors learning about like incredible techniques he had never been exposed to in the U.S. and they had like so so many different hospitals all across Paris in that era like each had a different specialty and he was just like like soaking this stuff up like a sponge and he, he didn't even want to go back to the US he thought it was just like so wonderful maybe I can start like a practice here in Paris or work for like an established doctor and he was like fluent in French and German so that absolutely you know could have worked out for him but unfortunately his funds were running low and so he had to return to the US and also in this era like many hospitals in Paris they were pretty much all of them they were open to you know like guest doctors and they just had to insert proof like a show proof oh I'm a doctor this is where I went to med school or like, you know, exchange them like coins and you would be allowed to watch the like operations in the, the hospitals or in the teaching universities and stuff and this was absolutely fascinating for Dr. Neuter who you know would t- often take a front row seat as often as possible but unfortunately in this era there was no anesthesia so the patient had to be like wide awake during the surgery and this was absolutely you know awful and this inspired him to you know get a really quick touch later on when he began doing surgeries himself he'd be just like do it as quickly as possible to minimize the patient's pain and you obviously not like try to hurt them too much like some people are just like way too like oh I'm gonna cut into this person like who cares if it hurts because I'm gonna show what a great doctor I am he always had a wonderful human touch with him but when he was back in Philadelphia the weather just wasn't good for him he went like to the south like to try to recover his health but he was like convinced by another doctor Dr. Thomas Harris who also like ironically was kind of sickly oh give Philadelphia another try son you can like work as my assistant and if it doesn't work out after a year then you can go back to Paris and as history turned out it 
really was like a wonderful opportunity for him. He started like growing even more in his reputation as a doctor. Now in the colonial era of American in the, the early 19th century, doctors only needed about like two years of medical school and they had to like sit in on certain lectures and stuff like, for example, chemistry or materia medica, like anatomy, physiology, things like that, and do some watch like surgeries being performed and then work about a year of study under doctors at the Pennsylvania hospital, which we would probably like consider an internship nowadays. And they had to have several rounds of exams by like higher doctors, both on private and public exams. And that was like pretty much it. You didn't have to go through like eight years of med school plus another four years of internship or whatever it is now. And they had to be at least 24 years old, even though like the average age of university entrance was much, much lower in that era. And obviously it goes with that saying, even the book says like you had to be like white and male and probably also have like a decent amount of money because like, you know, poor and working class boys weren't becoming doctors in that era because they just didn't have the class privilege to enable them like entry into that world. Founded in 1765, the University of Pennsylvania's medical school was like the premier like medical teaching establishment in the U.S. Like it was like founded even before America gained its independence, but a, a new rival started on the scene, Jefferson Medical College, which was founded in 18. 24 and it soon became hugely popular and at this time Philadelphia was basically like the medical mecca the like medical Athens of America people just like flocked there from far and wide to get their medical education and learn to be doctors in particular because there were like so so many patients there was just like growing at an unbelievable rate obviously it wasn't like as nearly as like populated as London or Paris in that era or even New York City but it was just really really up there and they had just so many chances to get patients particularly because many of these people were poor and working class and just getting hurt and injured on the job and just other things like the reality of living in the early 19th century with that like you know medicine modern medicine like many people like take for granted nowadays college received a brand new faculty like every single chair was brand new they had fired the old faculty for reasons that are explained and the book in this like so-called class of 1841 it was hugely popular all the students absolutely loved them and many of them were, were just you know like leading lights and very in demand doctors in their respective professions and they were like brilliant professors as well and, like people the graduates spoke glowingly about them for years afterward and many of them went on for like you know illustrious medical careers and innovations of their own Mutter, who was only 30 at the time was the youngest of the faculty and they were like the book describes many many of the other doctors on the faculty who were you know famous and like innovative and stuff in their own right and one of them was a, another plastic surgeon um, Dr. Joseph Pancoast he's one of the like more prominently described other doctors in the book and there's was another one um, Dr. Charles D. Meigs I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his last name it's um, M-E-I-G-S so you might have heard the quote famous quote something like oh a gentleman has clean hands that's why I never need to wash my hands like how dare you sully my reputation as a clean gentleman by saying I need to wash my hands and how dare like saying he basically like disavowed any responsibility for his patients getting sick because he would just like go from one patient to another he was an obstetrician and obviously in that era child bed fever was like a huge like death toll among women and so he's basically like touching all these patients without even washing his hands he's not washing the medical equipment or like even like washing the sheets they're laying on in the beds in the hospitals or at their homes. It was just like absolutely horrible. It was such a delicious shot in Freud when I read about his downfall later in the book. It was like couldn't have happened to a nicer person. It was just you know, like fast and furious once you know, he started falling from grace. And he was just also like a sexist. Like the way he described women, it was like really creepy, particularly the way he would talk about women's genitals. Like that's not something you want in a doctor that's an absolutely huge red flag like I mean I would personally never see a male doctor for anything below the neck because of like religious modesty reasons but like if I were going to see a male doctor that's not the kind of doctor I would want at all and like he was not just anti hand washing and anti you know, cleaning medical equipment but he was anti pain relief he would brag oh I never give pain relief to women in childbirth even when they're like begging for it and they're like the grips of greatest agony and he didn't believe in like pain really for any other surgeries and either it's just like horrible or, oh just let them be fully awake I don't care about that and he you know believed in like the sexist concept of like a brain sex like he would say in the lectures even when a woman was actually like there naked in front of the whole class and he's like petting her head oh this isn't a, the kind of person who could like write an Aeneid or lead armies to victory she has a small small brain but it's just big enough for love and it's horrible I can't believe anyone in the 21st century still subscribes to the sexist notion that like men and women have 
different brains, but obviously that's like a whole other detailed subject for another video. And he was a racist too. Like he gave, he was invited to give this speech to like an abolitionist group in Philadelphia. And instead he started talking about like, oh, like Negroes are inferior to whites and all this other really, really disgusting stuff. And as can be expected, it created quite an outroar. And he was just like, you know, just sounded like an absolutely like horrible piece of work. I would not have wanted this guy as a doctor myself. And he would so against like either an anesthesia, he would like prove it to the class that it was automatically dangerous. He would basically like kill these sheep with like giving them too much either and saying, oh, go examine the sheep. Oh, it's dead. Oh, and that's what happens to humans. You wouldn't want that to happen, would you? Even if a few people might survive the ether. And like he didn't realize, you know, like ether, like anesthesia or any medicine, it like depends on like your sex, your, like your age, your weight, things like that. Like, for example, when I was practically morbidly obese, I would have like required a greater dose of a vaccine or if I were getting like surgery, I would have like required a much different like amount of anesthesia than if I were as I am now after I have thankfully lost 75 pounds. So obviously you're not going to give like an animal the same type of anesthesia as you're giving a human. You have to factor in that animal's weight as well. Like when you like do like surgeries, I've seen a lot of vet shows on a tiny little mouse or a gerbil or a fish or something. You're not going to give that animal like the type of anesthesia. You're giving like a big like Great Dane dog or like a cow or a horse or something like that. And like one time he failed in this like little exercise. He started hearing like buying during class and all the students heard it too. And suddenly the sheep is like coming back. It's reviving. It's like so confused and groggy. And it's staggering to its feet and like getting out of that lecture hall and all the students are laughing and he's totally humiliated. I was like so, so happy to read about this guy's fall from grace. You know, it couldn't have happened to a nicer person. One of the things with me, Dr. Mooter, such a popular professor, besides just like he was like so like skilled and expertise in his like field of plastic surgery and doing like all these like wonderful revolutionary techniques to make people's lives better. He would give interactive lectures with like a Q&A and like basically a back and forth conversation with the students instead of just like lecturing to them one sided. He actually, you know, gave them the chance to ask any questions that were on their mind or like do concerns or like have, you know, conversations and dialogue with them, which is just what, you know, a good professor should be doing. Another wonderful thing about Dr. Moocher was that he cared for his patients as human beings and he wanted to relieve deformity and suffering. He wasn't in this for, you know, like getting glory or like good reputation or things like that. He was like really fascinated by these like, you know, horrible things that happen to people like a horn growing out of the head or like someone like permanently smiling because just like, like birth de defects or injuries that had just like totally altered the course of their appearance and not just that he would show the patients the tools prior to the surgery so they wouldn't be so scared obviously they were like wide awake until like anesthesia made its big breakthrough and he would acclimate the body parts to the manipulation from surgery like several days in advance he would start like massaging the parts that were going to be operated on so they wouldn't be like a complete shock to them they would be familiar with oh this is what the, the scalpel might feel like or this is what the doctor's hand is going to feel like when he's you know like going to like slice my arm or whatever else he was doing and he would also be honest with them like saying oh these are the odds of what might be the outcome for you or like this is what's going to happen and you might feel a little bit of pain he wasn't like oh I'm not going to tell you you have cancer or that it's like a 90% chance you're going to die and another really innovative thing he did he agitated for an actual recovery room which he didn't get right away because he obviously needed money and interest to build like a whole new operating suite just for the medical school so he got the local hospital to like rent out their rooms for him and people prior to this they were immediately discharged from the surgery like they would like once you're stitched up like send them home in a carriage I shouldn't even have to say why that's a horrible idea like it's like going bumping over the road and the carriage is rarely washed and there's a germ city and you've just been stitched up and this is before they even knew about it, things like you know germs and sterilization so they're obviously not doing things properly even if the surgery itself was a success like sometimes like infection or sepsis would set in just like horrible things many people these days it's it's like totally not a reality for us because we live in like a age of medical miracles and like the you know the past seems almost like the dark ages but this is like he was like so revolutionary for doing these things he was also a great advocate of cleaning tools and washing hands and also obviously the pain relief which other doctors like bragged about not doing. This is something interesting which I marked out about another doctor in the story because it's just you know so many like colorful anecdotes in this guy's career. Mutter eventually caught the attention of a British publishing house which was releasing what they hoped would be the definitive surgical textbook 
of the famous British, British surgeon Robert Liston, known as the fastest knife in the West End. Liston, like Nugent, was a colorful figure in surgery. He was tall, ambitious, and charismatic, often yelling, Tie me, gentlemen, tie me, to his students before beginning his amputation. Although Liston was renowned for his success stories, such as the removal of a 45-pound scrotal tumor in four minutes, prior to the operation, the poor patient had been forced to carry his scrotum around in a wheelbarrow. He also developed a reputation for the flamboyancy of his surgical failures. For instance, his joy at amputating a patient's leg at the thigh in less than three minutes was hindered greatly when he realized he had also inadvertently sawed off the patient's testicles. And perhaps most famously, Another leg amputation performed in less than three minutes had the unfortunate result of killing three people. A patient who survived the surgery but died of gangrene several days later, his young assistant, whose fingers he accidentally sawed off during surgery and who would also later succumb to gangrene, and a distinguished surgical spectator whose coattails Liston also slashed. The man who found himself surrounded by geysers of blood was so convinced that the knife had pierced his vitals that he immediately dropped dead from fright was later described as the only operation in history with a 300% mortality rate. Another thing which I really like appreciated learning about and found interesting in the book was about many of the women who came to Dr. Nutter for plastic surgeries. They were like burn survivors, like I myself had plastic surgery to remove burn scars many years ago. I had um, some second and first degree burns from my car accident on my stomach and abdomen. But anyway, these like women weren't just you know, like burned because like, oh, it, like hot oil from the stove, like caught on them or like they were like burned from the fireplace or like a child accidentally like pushed them in a spark you know got into their like clothing it was because the clothing they had to wear like to begin with was so restricted they could barely move around in all these like you know heavy skirts and like, like hobble skirts and things like that in comparison to men who were like all these free to wear trousers and much more relaxed clothing and things like that and this is like a particularly excerpt which is a very um telling of it how easily it could happen piece of hot ember loosens itself from its pack and rolls to the floor, its orange flame licking the fine lace of a petticoat, or a splatter of hot oil pops from a swinging pot and leaps, flame touched, onto a woolen apron, or even something as basic as a child running toward his mother to hug her legs and accidentally pushing her into the flames. Once started, these types of fires were devastatingly difficult to stop. Within moments, more of the women's clothing would begin to catch fire, layer after layer, building intensity, restricted in her movements, and impeded by that easy flammability of the natural fibers, she would helplessly flail, trying to reach the flame and beat it out. However, the air would only serve to fan the flames, making them grow larger, stronger, and more powerful. And in her bending over, the fire would often hit the neck of the dress, a virtual powder keg, in its combination of air, restricted dense fabrics, and light airy layers of decorative cloth, and this is where the real damage was done. The woman's face would soon be consumed with flame, burning, blistering, turning skin to liquid, and tearing flesh from bone. It was said the lucky ones died. The ones who did survive were cursed to live half a life as monsters. And it's particularly tragic for these women in that this era because, like, you know, without a husband to take care of them, they were pretty much, like, helpless. So they, like, shut away at home because they're so, like, badly deformed and mutilated and their like circle would shrink because like they can't like interact with people and they couldn't work in this era either so they were basically like helpless like if they didn't have plastic surgery to fix it up they would never be able to like find a husband and therefore like be in a position to be taken care of throughout their lives just like so so many horrible things about women's lives in the past many like young women these days they just like don't realize ever happened or they like take for granted we have so many freedoms like the, like the ability to like you know never marry or have children if you don't want it or to like you know work or like live independently things like that just like these women they had like they were like between a rock and a hard place and so that's why you know they came to him for surgery and the author also talks about how many of Dr. Nutter's alumni went on to like wonderful like venerable medical careers of their own particularly during the civil war and they came up with like wonderful innovations to help patients like so they learned from the best and like they spoke glowingly of him for many many years afterwards he just like had such a, like a great impact on like so so many lives and on like you know the medical world in in general and as someone who has had like many surgeries myself I've had um seven surgeries four were on my right leg and um three were plastic surgeries to remove the burn scars plus a dysplastic nevus that inadvertently removed some of the burn scar tissue and that's what inspired me in part to get the rest of my burn scars removed and I've also had you know like um seven fillings for like dental stuff and like three dental surgeries with like 
root canals and obviously without like pain relief for any of that I, I would have been you know screaming in agony who wants to be fully conscious during surgery it was bad enough when one of my root canals was started with that novocaine because the the doctor thought oh the root is dead by association because it's next door to the other root that had died so like surprise and so the entire world like owes a huge debt of gratitude to Dr. Mooter you know like surgery and plastic surgery in particular would be a much much different field without his like wonderful like pioneering revolutionary work and he also liked that it was an art form and that's why what my own plastic surgery liked about the discipline herself she chose it because it's like a perfect beautiful blend of like art and science unfortunately Dr. Mooter died very young but he did manage to bequeath his like wonderful collection of medical specimens and oddities and curiosities to the, the name of science and he established a permanent museum with all of this stuff which was you know his lifelong dream he didn't want his uh, collections and his research to die with him and his you know friends and people he had worked with and alumni were very instrumental in helping to get this museum made and it was fireproof one thing he insisted upon because that would be an absolute tragedy if all these like priceless like irreplaceable specimens and like bones and like medical curiosities and all this like other like, interesting stuff was like lost to the flames. I also love this um, way the author separated her um, notes in the back by each chapter. It's like a little skulls if you can see that's like after my own heart. I would absolutely love to put that in something I'm writing myself because you know I love Halloween and spooky season and the macabre and just things like that. So thank you very much for listening. I really really did enjoy this book very very much and I would highly recommend it if you're interested in like medical and scientific history and you like um, medical oddities and curiosities like I do. If you've not already, please consider subscribing. I talk about a lot of serious historical nonfiction like this, as well as great classic world literature, and um, hit the notification bell so you can be notified when I upload new videos, and I will see you again um, very soon. Thank you for watching. Bye.